Welcome everybody to South and Chillers Entertainment Podcast. This is Hero Darkness. Salt Logic. Which numbers? Valentine. Red Renegade. And joined by our friend, Yegar. And tonight, today, we are discussing about space and how it's the final frontier. And when you guys hear space, the final frontier, what comes to mind? Star Trek. Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> ha, I said it first. <laughs> Doesn't matter who said it first. We said the same time. Calm down. <laughs> okay, fine. I said it best. <laughs> okay. Well, Star what Trek. I hear when <laughs> I the final frontier, I think of it as the last place that we have not been able to explore, but we want to explore and pioneer. Yeah, that's normally the idea behind when you say uh, it's the final frontier. It's the last area after known area. It's an area beyond what's already been established. So you can say the Wild West was the frontier because it wasn't settled. It was open. And do you think it would be possible, maybe not now, maybe in the future, for us to settle and calm down the Wild West. Or in this case, space as the Wild West. Do you think we'll have stuff similar to like Firefly? Or would it be more like Star Trek? Well, yeah, Firefly, Star Trek, and then you also have something similar to Star Wars. Sorry. (laughs) Well, I haven't seen Firefly, so I don't have anything about that. I've never even heard of it. I heard about it, but I've never seen it. I know, shame on me. (laughs) Well, you're not the only one. (laughs) Okay, so Firefly, for those who don't know, is a show that was produced and directed by Josh, Josh Weed and the same guy who did uh, the Avengers film. Oh. And he created a space drama where the main characters, they're like space cowboys is probably the best way to put it. You had space stuff, but it also treated like and felt like it was out in the West. And they were rebels and they fought against the government or there's this civil war and they lost. But nonetheless, the idea that I liked about it was the fact that space and all the locale that they were at were treated like they were in the West. That's why I'm saying like Firefly because that's essentially kind of how the show is like. Oh, okay. Or do you have other ideas, other thoughts that come to mind with the Wild West or the frontier with space? Well, you said Last Frontier is of stuff that we know, correct? So the frontier is stuff that hasn't been settled, stuff that hasn't been claimed or explored. It's the unknown. Because believe it or not, Missouri was the frontier, was the last of the frontier before Kansas and all of that area in history. I'm not remembering it completely correctly, but there was a time where Missouri was considered the frontier. So wait, this final frontier is discovering all of it. Like the last known, well, unknown. Yes, so the space, moon, Mars, all of those would be considered a frontier since it's all wild and it's not settled or calm. And so the question is if we would one day be able to settle in the final frontier. Yes. Possibly, but very far. Like very far into the future. Okay. But how exactly would that be possible, though? Because we don't exactly know how big space itself is, so how do we know when we've reached the final frontier? Well, space is considered the final frontier because that's 
the only area that's unknown to us. We know everything about Earth, okay, as oh. far as land masses are concerned, but we're not quite for sure about what's beyond space, what's beyond our known solar system. We know about Andromeda, the Klepper, the, the Kiplar galaxy, but we don't know all the other stuff that's happening or what's out there. You see, the thing is, like Renegade said, it's gonna take a while before we actually reach the final frontier because right now we're just looking at it super positively. We don't know how far our technology is gonna advance, and if we're actually gonna be able to reach the final frontier. Because back in like in the old days, they believed like around 2016, 2019, we would have flying cars, and yet we haven't advanced that stage yet. So to believe that we'd be able to get to space in like the distant future, distant future is kind of a stretch considering how slow our advancements are is in technology and all that stuff. So honestly, it's I'm just taking it about. one step at a time because some like not everything is impossible. It's just eventually going to take more time than normal. Nothing is truly impossible. It's just a very very small chance. Okay. Right. Now, even though the chance can be like like very very minuscule, there's always that one small percent chance that it is likely. Okay, so the question is like, you all know that the Earth has a time limit in a sense, right? As to when, like, because of global warming and all that stuff. How long would it take for us to actually make something that's capable of reaching the outer depths of space before Earth itself implodes kind of thing. Like, that's the thing. We believe we have all this time, but we actually don't in a sense, right? So, it may, you're right, there is pot. there are possibilities, but because of a time limit, you might be able to reach those kind of possibilities in a sense, right? So. And it probably won't even be, not trying to sound negative, but it most like more or less won't be in our you know, our, t our time. Yeah, definitely not in our time, for sure. Definitely not in our time. I, um, would have to disagree with that we know everything about Earth, because 70% of the oceans are unexplored, so technically, we don't know everything about Earth, but with Space exploration comes tests in our oceans anyway. Um, things like they have to develop the technology that would survive in space. So in order to explore the final frontier, at least like explore it to the point of like possible colonization. So I thought that was interesting because like I was like, wait, we haven't explored all of Earth because I knew that a percentage of the oceans we haven't discovered. Which is kind of off topic, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, well, my, my comment was more in reference to the land masses. Because right. you're right, the ocean and just due to the pressure difference and just going down into explore the bottom of the ocean, we don't have anything right now that can withstand that level or that much pressure. It, it's hard for us to have something for that. And that's interesting because we struggle with the radiation problem in space. So it's kind of like, that's kind of a similarity too. Because until we get, you know, the whole radiation in, in space and being able to tolerate it, then, you know, we're not exploring as much as we could have if we had that technology. I know Hero went to um, a NASA museum over the last week, and I think he met something about something about the radiation. Okay, yes. Yeah, so the week that I was out, I was visiting my grandparents down in Florida. I went to the Kennedy Space uh, Center right there in Cape Canaveral. Now, in there, they had something and stated how the company SpaceX, or the company Boeing, both of these companies are working on space exploration along with NASA. They have a capsule that can have the pilot, the people inside that capsule, survive for 21 days. So we may not be able to survive years at the moment, 
but we can have them be safely protected for 21 days up in space. That's, that's interesting. I'm so like, I'm so glad you went there and you like read that because like all I'm going off of is the research that I've done and my client that brought that up. Like before that, I had no idea there was even radiation in space. Like I thought, I was wondering like why we couldn't like put out big ships to go explore <laughs> like Star Trek. Yeah, and another thing they've, uh, I was watching, the, we went to an IMAX theater that was there at the Space Center. And in the theater, the one that we watched, I don't remember the title right, right of hand, but they had a three astronauts at the International Space Station or the ISS as they were calling it where they, their whole purpose of being up there was to see the effects on, that space has on people for a year and what happens to them it. for a year. Now, it's interesting, when you're in space, your body stretches two inches because you don't have gravity keeping you together or f pushing you down. So in a sense, so when you say your body extends two inches, like what, you get longer like what do you mean by that yeah you grow two inches is the best way to put it okay so if you grew two inches like does that mean like when you get back to earth you'll lose or you'll keep them no no you go back to your original height oh okay yeah that's weird because <laughs> the reason why you quote unquote grow two inches is because you don't have gravity working with you Okay, that makes sense. And so without like, gravity, you're going to stretch or quote-unquote grow. I, I want to touch on a topic that Val like brought up when she was um talking about exploring space. She, she, was, she brought up the whole idea of colonizing space and all that stuff. I'm like, and I was thinking, if we're actually able to get that far into space we don't know what other life forms we're going to meet and all that stuff and we really don't know if we're going to have sufficient weapons to work in space and all that stuff right and to go on like these explorations like these proper explorations safely and all that stuff so with the whole expanding into space and all that stuff we have to look at our capabilities to defend and protect ourselves like do you guys think that would be possible as we go into space or like are... pardon me I think that goes back to what we talked about last week a little bit about aliens. If aliens were oh. on Earth, what would happen? So it goes, it goes down to, are they friendly or are they not? Because if they're friendly and we're like all the some of the our species out there in the universe where we like fighting, then we won't need weapons. But would would that be smart though to go into a, an unknown area, an unknown planet, without weapons? Like, that seems like a really dumb idea to do, in a sense. It, it does, it really does. Right? But at the same time you show up to an region with weapons, they can be your, your hostile and attack you at sight. So it's an interesting thing to think about. Mm, you okay. always run a risk of not wanting to start a war. I mean, you can even look at history and see even the pilgrims on the Mayflower brought some form of protection because they were unaware of what they'll be facing when they arrived in the new world. Right, right. Well, I guess it, it really all depends on whoever's in charge and how they feel they should approach the situation. Because me personally, I would rather have weapons for caution's sake. Because we, like you said, we don't know these, if these extra, extraterrestrial beings are more violent than humans are. And they would capture us and whatnot if we have no weapons or something like that. So it really depends on how or who the commander is at the time that um has reached that um who who's able to lead the, the expedition or whatever. So yeah, yeah, and that that brings up a lot of various things of this and that. Now another thing that I learned while I was at the space center is. Elon Musk and NASA and SpaceX, they're working on, by having by somewhere in the 2030s, the colony happening on Mars. And what they want to have there on that colony 
is a thousand people living there on Mars. Oh. So they must know something or must be working on something that we don't know about that will be able to and allow them to live there. And maybe they'll find something or maybe lead's the magic thing that will protect them while they're in space. But that brings up an interesting aspect because lead is so heavy in its metal state. That's one of the most heaviest uh, metals that we know. Right. And can we be able to have that there and be able to transport that in space? Now, they are working on other rockets that they can use to transport and do various things that will be better than the uh, space shuttles. Because my dad put it, space shuttles act like a glorified uh, pickup truck in space. Right, right. And I believe it's kind of human interest in the way we are so inquisitive about things. We want to explore all that there is. Well, we probably are because there's no way, because there's always questions that human always asks and, and all that stuff. And we make answers, we create answers to solve those questions. And if we find those answers don't work, we go look for another answer. So I think it's impossible to say humans would be satisfied with what they know or what they've learned. There's, they're all, we're always going to be looking for something new and different. Yes, we're, we're always going to be looking for something new, something different. And what are we going to do? Are we going to be able to create it? And if you were going to create your final frontier or be over a section of space how would you want your front how would you want your settlement not your frontier but your settlement to be like huh, um well just the thing is oh, go ahead. just just in general it it there'll be a lot of emptiness let's say you spend i think most of the time just traveling from planet to planet than anything else so be you being stuck inside a spaceship, probably not getting cabin fever for say, going from place to place. And at our current technology rate, now let's say we get to Star Trek level and warp speeds, how do we know when to get out of warp speed? How do we know when to stop when we're at the next source system? All that math and calculation. But yeah, I think you'll still have a lot of downtime between each jump, each warp. You gotta make sure you have stuff to occupy your time with. You see, the thing is with the whole frontier thing, I think, like Salt said, you need to take baby steps. You need to make your own frontier and then plan on what you're going to be doing after that. Because there's no point in trying to go as far as you can and stretch your resources because that's just going to weaken you and everyone else. So say our first frontier is going to be Mars and we can set up like a military base there and then try to expand from there instead of trying to take over Mars, then take over another planet, then take over another planet. So I think we have to do this whole frontier thing in um, decimal, like point form. So we we do A, we wait a few years, do B, wait a few years, we replenish stocks in that planet, in that area, and then keep on expanding from there instead of trying to do everything in one fell swoop. Yeah. Or even before we go to Mars, we have a staging point on the moon. True. Because you are right, and Saul is right as well. We don't want to overextend, because when we over overextend, things collapse in on itself. And we have history to look at that. A lot of empires overextended their, themselves and had more territory than what they can handle, and they collapsed on themselves. Yeah. And that's not including all the politics that went down in behind the scenes with all the things that caused it to fall. You can take a look at the Roman Empire, what happened to the Greeks, even what happened to the 19th, 18th century empires as well, the British Empire, the Ottoman Empire. You know, things happened in history that caused those empires to stop being empires. Right, right. And so same thing with exploring. You want to create yourself an outpost and a 
resupply station. Then you go for some more, create another outpost, another resupply station, so on and right. so forth. And here's the thing about whole, making a, a whole thing like you were mentioning all the empires and all that stuff. And even if we manage to make all these settlements and all that stuff, we have to figure out different ways to try to defend them. Like what we're talking about is is um finding new planets and all that stuff. And how will we because we're we're doing this on the assumption that all life everywhere else is safe and no one else will try to invade us. So how are we going to create defenses and all that stuff against? Um, for invasion and all that stuff kind of thing. So there's all that that we have to take into consideration when we're talking about frontiers and exploration and all that stuff because the worst thing that can happen is you find a nice place so whatever a nice planet or whatever you take it over and then you you have that snatched from you a few years later or whatever. So I'm gonna take all that into consideration I think. And that's with the well, assumption then... that it's unoccupied. Go on Salt. True. Well, even then, even if you do find something, let alone with establishing, you know, a place to start, you also have to be able to find a way to survive. And or, you know, you're going to have to grow crops and things like that. You have to know if it's even able to do that. Because, yes, you may be able to build a settlement, but what good is that going to do if you can't keep yourself alive? You're just going to be dead in however long it takes, depending on where you find yourself a settlement at. Right, right, that's true. Because not every place is going to be good enough to grow things on. Some could be entirely too cold, some could be entirely too hot, or just n no nutrition and things like that to grow things on. You, you know, talk about growing uh, in the IMAX movie that I watched, the IMAX theater, they actually grew lettuce in space. So on the International Space Station, they are working on how to grow things in space. How will they turn out? What are viable things to grow? And what's not? And they're growing in this red or purple light in the International Space Station. Right, right. So there are NASA and other space programs are already taking into consideration these things, so they can survive and make these long trips and do the mission to Mars. You see, here's and, the thing though, like we're always we're always trying to think of ways to find like different ways that we can grow our foreign not our like our um our vegetables and our products on other plants. But that's here's the thing. We don't know for a fact that we can do that. Like what if we need to adapt to like the vegetation in those planets? What are we gonna do then? Like it, is the vegetation in that planet, can, are we going to be able to eat the vegetation in that planet? We have to take all these things into consideration when we uh, when we think about making a frontier at a certain planet or area or whatever. That is true. And I think that's when we bring in the supplies, we plant the stuff, and we bring in some of our test strats and stuff on that line and have them live on said planet to see what happens to them when they eat the food made mm -hmm. on said planet. Or... We go to said planet, we bring in a good amount of said items from the place. So the dirt and stuff on that line bring it back to us. Yeah. Uh, resources and, and then we create a phone that way from the amount of resources, plenty of resources we got there to see what happens. That could right. that could ruin the test results, but that, that will be a start. Yeah, like the whole animal testing thing that you brought up might be a bit touchy subject, a bit touch of a subject to do, because you know how people how people are right now and the whole animal abuse and all that thing. So people might consider well, that animal abuse, just sending animals out there, or whatever. So, well, we do have test rats. Well, they do tests on rats. So those if we use rats, that will fine. But if we try to go to different animals outside mm -hmm. of the usual stuff, that's what's we'll getting touchy. Right, right, right. And when we're talking about animals, like, are we talking about, like, if we migrate to another planet, do we intend to bring species from Earth to inhabit those planets? Are we talking about, it like... It would be more convenient. Yeah. I would, would say yes. Instead of having to, like, import beef from Earth to, say, Mars. Right, right. 
and you know you bring up some good points Yegar about the whole animals and how there's people iffy touchy and that science do use as Rich was pointing out kind of a set number or a set type of animals because each animal reacts to how close to the human body so we use different animals for testing our medication or other implants to see how it would work and what would happen to it because what do we want to do we want to test things on humans I mean that's already a touchy subject and it's highly frowned upon as it is right now right so science already uses as Rich established the norm animals and each animal is different we test on pigs we test on sheep we test on the rats and the mouse all because they have something that's similar to the human whether it's the cardio system whether it's the pulmonary system or it's the muscles it just all depends because before even the space program launched a human into space they launched a monkey up into space and dogs and cats just to see what would and happen spiders. and spiders <laughs> and spiders okay I think this part was the very first important to space. <laughs> <laughs> so we got it back. So we sent this part in space to see what it would do, and they bring this matter back, and the entire spaceship was one big spider web since it could jump from one end of the spaceship to the next. It had a ball up in it. <laughs> and as far as will we bring our own plants and that I say yes because just because we go to a new location doesn't mean we know what's going to be edible and what's not going to be edible for us and so we're going to bring stuff that we're familiar with and then we use again the test animals to find out if, if they're not or not if they are or not 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 or not that makes no sense <laughs> <laughs> they're definitely not going to be safe to eat so we're not going to try it. We'll stick with the food we know because we're screwed about experimenting on new stuff. And to also answer the other question about vegetation or other things, we do, where Earth is located at in what's classified as the Goldilocks Zone. Are you guys mm -hmm. familiar with the term Goldilocks Zone? I am not. No. Can you please explain? Nope. The Goldilocks Zone is where Earth is currently at. It is at the right distance from the, the from the sun. Oh, oh, now I remember. Okay. Yeah. Continue it, that. It, it, it's the right distance from the sun where we're not too hot and we're not too cold. We're at the right distance where we're not going to die or we're not going to freeze. If we're any closer oh, yeah. or any farther away, we wouldn't be able to survive. So Earth is in what's called the Goldilocks zone. And NASA has discovered through the Hubble telescope another planet that is in the Goldilocks zone. It's Kepler and it has like a number this that and I don't remember it right off hand. I'll leave it in the description below on what planet number it is but I'm pretty sure it's in the Kepler system and that one bears resemblance um, based on the information from the Kepler or not from, from the Hubble telescope on what's there. Now NASA is planning on launching another telescope into space that is going to be stronger and more powerful than the Hubble. But it's going to be more infrared instead of taking pictures of space. We won't get the nice cool pictures that we've been getting. They're sending out another telescope for a different purpose. Instead of collecting images of space, instead of collecting those now, I think I said they'll be infrared to check more for heat. And other stuff. I don't. I don't think it's infrared, but it's not going to be taking pictures. It'd be serving as a different purpose. We are already taking steps to make to find a way to settle space. And as Valentine has pointed out and t discussed in our previous podcast, we have yet to find a way to overcome the radiation. We're safe right now with one of the capsules for 21 days. But that's just 21 days, but we're going to spend years and years and lifespans, generation after generation, we need something that can support past 21 days. Agreed.
because the turn one is the max either. There's no way of store unless you. There's no way of storing multiple of them since once in space the turn one days should start. Due to, due to the way the space is, you can't just store them inside each other. One time break away, the next one's up and running because that would defeat the purpose. You want to look that way. So that's definitely something that needs to advance. Is you to survive in space for years on end, and then creating artificial gravity in space. Just so everything our body can keep functioning correctly. I am curious though about Renegades and Valentine's thoughts and also Salt's thoughts on what has <laughs> been discussed so far. Ladies first. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen first. <laughs> well, just to break the awkward silence, um, I just have a few, few, few words here. Um, but it's not a matter of if; it's just a matter of when. Okay. Yeah. Those, those are those are my simple thoughts for that. Because it really isn't a matter of if, it's just a matter of when it's going to happen. Okay. Do you think that when the mission to Mars and the colony on Mars, do you think that's going to be a success? Or is there going to be a lot of unknown in our really first outpost in space? Well, there's definitely going to be a lot of unknown to it. Unknown in what regard? Unknown about vegetation and growing things there? Or unknown to the terrain? Just in general, there's going to be a lot of unknown because anything is a possibility when you're going somewhere you've never been to. Or not even that, it's just when you don't take the time to research thoroughly to see what all is going to... if it's inhabitable, needless to say. Yes. Now, we have launched rovers onto Mars, and so we have maps of Mars already because of the rovers, and some of them have lasted longer than anticipated. So the territory isn't so much unknown. But it's unknown to the human foot. We have a general idea what it is, but once we get out there, we dip it. But yeah, having a map of the area is always something good to have. Unless you don't a little lost, easier. Like in Minecraft. <laughs> well, if it's cool, if we have a map, we get lost, and we don't know how to get back to base. But that's the fun part. But that's... Yeah, you, but you say that now death, until yes, you have a limited... Is... <laughs> oh no, oh, wow. I have lost where my house is. It has all 95 yeah. of my diamonds. That actually makes a good point. Once but when death is a possibility, Earth, then. But once we leave Earth and start exploring, how would we know how to get back to Earth? Ooh. Ah. Uh, do, do, do. Sorry. Okay, obviously. It's... That is true. <laughs> No, but in all realness, though, we should be able to have, like, homing beacons or whatever, and transmitters, and whatever. So, like, before we have an exploration out to Mars or whatever, we're most likely going to take a certain route, or plan a certain route from Mars to Earth, and we probably can follow that route back. So I don't think getting back to Earth would be a problem, per se. Hopefully not. All right, Valentin, have you gathered your thoughts? Um, I don't know. It's just all very. Don't laugh at me. It's just Fine. all very. Um, We're laughing with you. <laughs> right. It's all very unknown. So, I hope that eventually we can get to a place where we can travel far and figure out like. How to grow things and stuff, but it just seems like so. It seems so far away. I don't know. I can't even fathom it, but. 
I think that the whole animal testing thing is kind of weird, but, like, what else are we supposed to do? All right. Test on humans? Like, I don't know. Maybe they'll, like, develop a technology where we won't even have to test. Like, maybe we can just test it in a lab and see if it's edible or not or something. What what they could do is probably just break it down and try to see what it's in the substance because we already know what's already harmful to the human body. So all they could do is just break it down to see what's in it. Well, that can only work if we can recognize the substance within it. Like, if, say we go to Mars and we find substances that we don't recognize. Like, how are we going to know if it's good for us or bad for us without actually using living things, right? So there's only so much things you can do with breaking things down. Well, but you know what's toxic to the human body, so maybe maybe if it has, like, sister elements or something of right. something that would harm us, we would know. I wouldn't expect true, to go true. to another planet and discover new elements. That would be interesting. But different, you know, at least on Earth, we have encountered the same nutrients, the same things all throughout, throughout it. So we get to a planet, we will then have a baseline of knowing when we break down said new plant, what would said plant be in, and what are the substances inside the plant. If we have so much scientific evidence, it'll be easy for us to break down said item. Because the periodic table is stuff that we've known, and it's built for things to be added for things we don't know. And lastly, Renegade, your thoughts. So, my whole take on this is kind of similar well I, I kind of want to backtrack and like redo some of the things I like what Jaeger said beforehand how we should take all this Final Frontier stuff like little by little like a green with salt as well how we need to take it one step at a time start with the moon or Mars as we're starting to do what SpaceX is planning to do and uh, work our way from there. And an another thing to the whole planting stuff in different environments, I thought about could we just like export like say soil from Earth, stuff that we know, and like use that for planting? But you gotta also realize the distance and stuff from there, from here to there. Something's gonna make sure that is it still going to be valid by the time we get there? Despite the fact soil, soil, I mean, I don't think you can really fuck that up, but that's aside from the point. It varies, so to speak. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, there, there's a lot of different things we're going to have to do to make sure we can make it all work. And we are making progress and steps in the right direction. It's just seeing how it works and how everything will play out. So it may be plausible to settle and start making our way through the final frontier. It may not even work out. Only the trial and error of Mars and what's happening in the 20 and what will happen in the 2030s to see if things will work out. Now, does anyone have any questions they want to ask? Uh, I don't. I don't either. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we covered most of the stuff relating to the frontier. I still like my question. That's something got to think about. How will we get back to Earth once we leave the solar system? Honestly, we'd have to figure out some way, like maybe, I, I don't even, I'm trying to like think of how it's possible that we can do this. I think like maybe a telescope or something to like figure out where Earth is in the sky, to, like go from there, well, maybe somehow do. access. We can still use the stars. We have to create a compass for space. Random <laughs> thought. But that's what journalism will come down to. Very interesting point.
And I think we'll leave the discussion here. Let us know if you got anything that you want to add or discuss in the uh, comment section below. This has been a Celtic Chillers Entertainment podcast. This is Hero Darkness. Don't watch it. Oh, uh, yeah, you're hungry. <laughs> Which numbers? Valentine. And Red Renegade. And as always, guys, stay salty.